tennis, we're gonna go over some simple ways to improve your technique, your strategy, your footwork. All I ask is that you hit the like button. Uh, and if you're not watching this while I'm actually doing it live, you can always throw your comment or question uh, below and I will get to it uh, in the near future. So let's talk about a couple things here. First, let's talk about some singles strategy. And uh, as you come in, thank you so much for joining. Just make sure you hit that like button. Here's a simple, simple idea that is gonna help you win more singles matches. Hey, what's up? Hey, hey, what's going on, everyone? Thanks so much for coming in. Be sure to hit that like button. I appreciate it. We are live. Here's a simple way to hit deeper. What's up, John? Uh, hey, <laughs> hi, Yejin, hi. All right, so here's a simple way to win more singles matches. And doubles too, but let's go over singles. Hey, what's up? Hey, hey, hey. And that is to, I want you to regulate the height over the net. If you could in the comment section right now, just tell me, hello, hello. Just tell me uh, what percentage of the time when you're hitting a ground stroke in a singles match that you are thinking about the height over the net, that you're thinking about how high you're trying to hit the ball over the net. Just throw that in the comment section. I've got 31 people who just popped in and I've got one like. Oh, that hurts me. Oh, that hurts me. For every non-like, I think it's a dislike. So I don't like that. Make sure you hit that like button. So just tell me what percentage of the time do you think about the height you're trying to hit over the net when hitting ground strokes? I just saw somebody put a comment or a question in about the wrist or something. I'm going to get to that get to your questions in just a second, so feel free to write your questions in uh, as we go here. So the answer, I would hope, would be 100% of the time. 100% of the time, when you're hitting a ground stroke, you're understanding and thinking about what height you're trying to hit. I'll tell you this. In my experience, most players aim too low over the net. They think that hitting fast and low over the net, all right, so we got 50%, that's better than, than most, so that's awesome. It should be 100, right? Like, imagine if I were asking you, let's say I'm a driving instructor, right? I'm teaching you to drive a car. And I say, hey, what percentage of the time when you're driving, are you trying to keep the car on the road? Right, and you said, yeah, because most people say 10%, 20%. We would be crashing all the time. We'd be cr running our car off the road all the time, 30%. The goal is 100%, right? I would want to say to a driving instructor, hey, 100% of the time, I am trying to keep the ball, I'm sorry, keep the ball, keep the car on the road. It's the same idea. It doesn't mean you always hit your target, but you should attempt it. LeBron James is always aiming for the hoop when he shoots. Okay, so you should have a target in your mind of height over the net. The height you hit over the net regulates the depth. So if you find that your ground strokes are hit, Adam, that's not true. There's, it, it's not 0%. Because when you try to lob, you're thinking of height over the net. But that's usually the only time that people think of height. But, the, but if your balls are landing short, if you're noticing in your ground strokes, like, man, my ball just keeps landing short in the service box. It's not because you need to hit the ball harder or hit less spin or necessarily drive through the ball and hit flatter. That's not really what we're thinking. What you want to do is just think, I'm going to hit higher over the net because the height you hit the ball over the net plus the speed you hit plus the spin you put on the ball, there you go, there you go, Adam, so it's not zero, uh, is going to equal where the ball lands. The speed you hit plus the spin you put on the ball plus the height the ball goes over the net equals where the ball lands. So here's what I would suggest to you, and I've got 41 people in here, only 11 likes. I always like to get those likes catching up to the people in here, so make sure you hit that like button. Trust me, it helps me a lot, so thank you so much. If you are playing a singles match, I want you to aim, on average, higher over the net than your opponent. If you're the one hitting higher, there you go, Connolly, I like it. If you're the one hitting higher over the net, two amazing things happen. You hit the net less, which is the number one mistake made on a tennis court, and you hit the ball deeper. So let me ask you, wouldn't you love to hit the net less than your opponent? Well, that's an obvious yes. Wouldn't you love to hit deeper in the court than your opponent? Yes. So hit the ball higher over the net than you normally do. Now, I always get people who say things like, 
well, yeah, but then I'm just moonballing or then I'm just going to be, um, oh, hitting deeper has more chances of going out. You're right, Manu John. You're right. That's a hundred percent correct. And leaving my house, I have a greater chance of getting hit by a car than if I just stay in my basement. You, you can't live life that way, right? There's always danger. Any, it's just how it works. By the way, by the way, I want you to all right now. Thank you. Yeah, Jin, thank you for that. That ha ha. What, um, what percentage of the points? Ready for this? I'm going to put a score on the board. And, and Adam, we'll talk about that, right? Um, uh, good question. We'll, we'll, that's all part of this presentation we're going to talk about. Hitting the net loses the point 100% of the time. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm going to put a score up on the board. This is a score that we have all had when playing tennis. And I'm going to say you won at that score. And then I'm going to ask you a question. Ready? Here's the score. All right. Can you see that? 6-3, six, 6-3. Three, six, three. Do you see that? 6-3, six, 6-3. Three, six, three. You won 6-3, six, 6-3. Three, six, three. What percentage of the points did you win? On average, when you win a match 6-3, six, 6-3, three, six, three, what percentage of the points? Let's say you played 70 points to win 6-3, six, 6-3. Three, six, three. What percentage of the points did you win? We've got 70, we've got 75 from the same person. Right, Give, because we, when we understand this, we've got 55 from John, we got 51, <laughs> Adam. How do you win 10% of the points yet you won 6363? We've got 90, we've got 95. Mike said, okay, uh, we got 60, we got 60, we got 60, yeah, 55, it's good, so we got a big range, maybe 55, yeah, so all of you saying 55 is correct, 55% of the points, so that means 20, uh, I'm not talking about errors and winners, I'm just talking about how you uh, won, Right? Because you can win with a winner or you can win with an error. I'm not talking about winners and errors. I'm simply saying what percentage of the points did you win? 80%? You will never win 80% of the points in a match. I don't care how much better than your opponent you are. Meant 60? It's 55%. 55. Which means what... Okay, now hold on just a second. You don't need a calculator or an abacus for this. What percentage of the points did you lose? What's up, Lart? Hello. What percentage of the points did you lose if you won the match 6-3, six, 6-3? Three, six, three? Yes, the research has been done. Craig O'Shaughnessy, the leading statistician in the entire world on men's and women's singles and doubles on the Pro Tour. And there's no difference between pro. Hey, look at that. Look at that math, 45%. Okay, so you ready for this? That means you lost 45% of the points. Do you know how many people find that unacceptable? Unacceptable. Will Hamilton from Fuzzy Yellow Balls just sent me a text message. I would love to know what he just wrote. All right, so what percentage, uh, I'm sorry, not one percentage. Do you know that losing 45% of the points is unacceptable to people? It shouldn't be. It should be completely acceptable. Why do you care what percentage of the points? It's funny. I mentioned hit the ball 100% of the people, exactly. Um, you Winning 55% of the points is basically the best you're ever going to do. That's the best. This is why when you play people who you should be able to crush, it's always so much closer than you think. Man, you, I should have destroyed that guy. And for some reason, it was seven, five, six, four. I'm so much better than him. You are. You're so much better than he is that you won seven, five, six, four. Have you ever noticed in the first round of the Grand Slams, you'll have an upset or you'll have a really close couple sets? The pros aren't walking away going, oh my gosh, how could that have happened? 60% <laughs> of the time. It works every time. 
What is that? It smells like gas. What, what, what was the? What did? It, what did Ron Burgundy? Ron Burgundy say? Smells like. Um, smells like gasoline or something. It's pungent. I forget what the words were. I forget. Um, so the idea is this: you are always going to lose points. The magic number is fifty-five. All you need to do is. If you can win 55, it works every time. If you can win 55% of the points, uh, you're going to dominate a tennis match. So if you're neck and neck with someone, you've just got to figure out how to win out of 100 points, five extra points to move it to 55, 45. It's a really piece, an important piece of advice. But what happens is people will go to the net and uh, let's take Djokovic and uh, Alcaraz. Let's, let's do a different strategy here. Djokovic and Alcaraz. Don't worry, I've already looked at the stats. Wimbledon final. The Wimbledon final. Uh, you uh, try and train to work harder to win every uh, more points and try to get that higher percentage. Uh, I completely disagree. I completely disagree. What percentage of the points do the pros win? So uh, let, me, let me read this thing. I, I have to disagree at this point. You should try to train and work harder to win even more points and try to get that higher percentage. It seems like it's more about which points I'm winning and losing. All right. Um, uh, I completely disagree. So when, let me explain. When, okay, oh, here, here's a question for you. Uh, here, here's a question. Sahil. Sahil. What per, or now remember, uh, Nadal has won uh, how many? 14 Roland Garrises? Somebody tell me, has Nadal won 14 French Opens? Sahil, how, what percentage of the points, Sahil, has Nadal won at the French Open in his entire career? All of the French Opens that he's played. What percentage? Yes, 14. Yep. Thank you. Sahil, how, what percentage of all the points, not matches, not games, not sets, not titles, each point, 15, 30, 40 game, 15, 30, 40, each point, he's probably played tens of thousands of points at the French Open. Do you know what percentage of the points he has won at the French Open? Do you know what it is? Now remember, he has won 14 of these things. And everyone talks about how he dominates Sahil. How can he only win 40% of the points? <laughs> He's winning 14. It has to be more than 50. It has to be more than 50. Come on. It has to be more than 50. He has to win more points than he loses. It has to be more than 50. The answer is 50 Six. So let me explain something. Remember how we talked about 55? 55, uh, you're right. He's won 14 Grand Slams. He's, he's lost, what, three times? Twice to Djokovic and once to um, Robin Soderling, right? Was it twice to Djokovic and once to Soderling? I think. Uh, some play more po you're right. You're right, Sahil. But it, that's not, I understand what you're saying. Man, Sahil, I don't think I'm your coach, man. I don't think I'm the coach for you. S Sahil, let me explain something to you. If you have, if you go to Las Vegas, I, I got to say this. Sahil, if you go to Las Vegas and there is a game that you can win 55% of the time, play it. <laughs> you can't say to yourself, yeah, but I'm going to lose 45 Okay, <laughs> next topic. Some people just cannot be convinced no matter how much you, you explain to them that you wanna, what do you think is percentage tennis? What is percentage tennis? It doesn't mean you win every point. It just means you win more points than you lose in a given scenario if you play a certain tactic or swing a certain way. There's nobody who can win every single tennis match. And the difference between, take um, 2006, Federer's most, uh, uh, it's impossible, Sahil. Not one match you've ever played have you won 70% of the points. That means every match you play is six love, six love, six love, six love, and they're only winning one point every other game. It's 40 love, 40-15, 40 love, 40-15. You cannot play that way. 
Nobody wins 70% of the points. If you're winning 70% of the points, your level of play is up here and you're playing beginners. That's how you win 70% of the points. Because yeah, yeah, he he's, he's stuck on, no, you gotta win. I guarantee you Sahil has not won 70% of the points. Um, yeah, if you win, then you, Sahil, you show me, you show me a tournament where Roger Federer won every single match, six love, six love, six love. We're living in reality, Sahil. We're living in reality here. Holy smokes. Woo. This is, uh, I, I came on here live to like want to share some ideas with people, but we've got, we've got some people who are just, so I, I'm going to, I'm just going to forget about it. Yes, yeah, Sahil is the greatest tennis player of all time. Um, guys, don't do anything other than what Sahil tells you. Whew, this is, this is interesting. All right, so here's the next idea. The next idea is, okay, how do we win? How do we win 55% of the points? Let me give you an amazing stat. Uh, maybe he is confusing points with games. You're right, I don't know. Because you, you can't win 70% of the points. Um, and, I, and you can't tell me that should be your goal. You'll never achieve that goal ever. Unless you're playing beginners who, who people who, who serve like this, you'll never win 50% of the, or 70% uh, of the games or points. So how do we win 55% of the points in a match? We do so by getting to the net more. You wanna hear an amazing stat? I want you to take Roger Federer's entire career. I want you to take Roger Federer's entire career, I believe from 98, to 2001, right? Wasn't it like 23 years? Take every point where he stayed behind the baseline. Do you know that Federer only won uh, 98 to 2001? Yep, how did, yep, there you go. Do you know that Federer only won 47% of the points when he stayed behind the baseline? Roger Federer, Lost, thank you for the wow, because that is a wow. Roger Federer won less than he lost when he stayed at the, behind the baseline for the entire point. Because when he stays behind the baseline, that includes when the opponent stays behind the baseline and comes to the net. Do you know that if Roger Federer never went to the net, we would have no idea who he is. The only thing that allows the pros to win is if you go to the net. You can look it up. Uh, what percentage of the points did Djokovic win when he went to the net at Wimbledon. Do you know? Novak Djokovic. What percentage of the points did he win at the net this past Wimbledon? Do you know what percentage it is? If some of you have the Wimbledon app, if some of you have the Wimbledon app, you can go right now on the Wimbledon app and you can look it up. And uh, we have one person who is off by one uh, percentage point. We have two people who are off by one percentage point. When Novak Djokovic went to the net, he won 71% of the points. Novak Djokovic won 71% of the points. Novak Djokovic won 71% of the points when he was at the net. Now, we don't think of Djokovic as being some amazing volleyer. In fact, people will make fun of me because I will show his overhead technique and say, oh, Ryan, why are you showing Djokovic's overhead technique? His overhead's horrible. No, it's, it's amazing. It's just not up to par with Federer's and Sampras's, but it's still better than any of ours. Yes, winning 71% of the points at the net is fantastic. Now, oh, here we go. Thank you, Bobby. So I need to learn to come to the net more and at the right time. Thank you so much, Bobby. Bobby, if you have, if you have a YouTube channel, I'll follow you. Thank you so much for the donation. Uh, if you could, um, do you have a YouTube channel? 
Do you have a YouTube channel? Let me see. Um, let me see. Bobby Greer. If he has a YouTube channel, I'll follow him right now for that donation. Thank you so much. Of course, when I go on my YouTube channel, um, a, a, a Top Spin Pro advertisement pops up. Of course. Let me see. Um, it, it was Bobby Greer, right? Let me see. Let me see. I don't know if, um, nope, just a fan of your code. All right, thank you so much. I was gonna follow you, so I appreciate it. That's so kind of you. Um, so thank you for that. Do you know what Alcaraz's winning percentage was? Do you know what Alcaraz's winning percentage was at the net? So Novak Djokovic, when Djokovic went to the net, he won 71% of the points. Do you know what Carlos Alcaraz's winning percentage was at the net? Anyone want to take a guess? We got 65, da, 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 60, 75. It was the exact same. 71%. Now, some of you are going to be skeptical of this. Guys, go on the Wimbledon app. Get it on your phone, go to the final, look at the stats breakdown, and look at net points won. They both won the identical percentage, 71%. Not combined. Uh, not a rela no relationship, Yejin. Uh, just that going to the net is a huge advantage. So here, here is the idea. Do you know how many more points... <laughs> I'm skeptical, but I believe you. Good. <laughs> Do you know how many more points? Here's the last step. Do you know how many more points uh, Carlos won compared to Djokovic? Do you know how many more points? Two. Two points. Carlos Alcaraz won two more points than Novak Djokovic. I would love if somebody in the comment section had the Wimbledon app on your phone. Click it, look at the final, the total number, it's two extra points. You're not going to win 70% of the points. Sometimes you only win two, not 51 to 49, I'm talking two points more. The goal is to somehow get to 55% in order to start winning more matches. And you do that by being up at the net because if they're winning 71% of the, yes, Sahil would have absolutely beaten Djokovic. He would have beaten, he would have beaten Djokovic and Alcaraz playing doubles against him. Um, the, I'm just kidding, Sahil, but... You got to admit, you, were, you, were, you weren't letting it go. If they're winning 71% of the points at the net and they finish neck and neck, that means when they're behind the baseline, they're less than 50%. It only makes sense. If they're winning 71% at the net and they finish neck and neck, well, two extra points, correct, 55% requires a lot of work. You are right. You are 100% right. When you dominate someone, you should play a match. All of you, play a match and chart the match and look how close the points were. This is why as a coach, if I have two, so any of you who are coaches, you know this. If you have coaches, or if I have any coaches here, let's say you're giving a, a lesson to two students who are slightly different levels of play, right? They're friends and they want to take a lesson together and they say, hey, let's play out points. You do not play games. You play games, they are the, the person who's better is going to destroy the person who's worse. You play a tiebreaker, play a 10 point tiebreaker. And it's like, oh, it was 10 to seven. And the person who got seven's like, hey, that's pretty good. But if you but if you do games, that's four love or three love. And that's the um and so all of a sudden the person is like, oh, I'm losing three love, but they have all these points that they didn't get any credit for. So really, really important. Uh, great job on the video. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sean's Tennis Journey Together. Love it. Net play is so important. Uh, why do you think there are less and less servant volleyers nowadays? It isn't because of the success rate. 
Um, the success rate is identical now as it was 30 years ago. They're winning the same, serve and volleyers now are winning the identical percentage. And again, I'm only telling you this because of Craig O'Shaughnessy, the leading statistician who works side by side uh, uh, with Will Hamilton to create these strategy products uh, that I sometimes share with you on my videos. Craig O'Shaughnessy was hired by, Nov uh, by Novak Djokovic several years ago to teach him how to beat Nadal. And then he just rolled through him in the final of the uh, Australian Open that year in three straight sets. Uh, but the, the points were very close. Um, but that's like, he's the world's expert in, in strategy. The reason has nothing to do with strings. It has nothing to do with rackets. It has nothing to do with anything. It's the same winning percentage. You, if, if you go to the net 600 times and you win 67% of the points, and then you go to the net 200 times and you win 67% of the points, you would say to yourself, hey, why aren't you, go why aren't you serving and volleying more? Why aren't you going to the net more? Uh, the answer, I have no idea. It's not sexy, uh, but I, like, it's not cool to, to play serve and volley, even though it, you will win more points serving and volleying if you have a serve and if you have a split step and you, if you have a volley, um, then if you hang behind the baseline, the net is where you, net is where you win. All right, let's get to some technique stuff because I got some questions. Uh, I changed my game to serve and volley because I'm disabled and can't run around anymore. Yeah, that's awesome. That's going to go to, you're going to go to the net more often. You're going to, like, if you're tired, serve and volley. The point's going to be over quicker and it's less running. So we need to reduce our mistakes to below 45%. So we need to reduce our mistakes to below. I'm not sure about that um, because winning, of course, you're trying to hit fewer mistakes. I, without a doubt, sure. I agree with that. Australian dude served a volley in the first round, matched up versus Djokovic. Uh, need to be uh, good on volley and drop shot then. Uh, and so here's the thing. Let's talk about the volleys. When your opponent comes to the net, what are the shots that you go for? So can all of you, are you going to collab with intuitive tennis? No, collabing is, there's no benefit to collabing other than it just takes a ton of time, to be honest. And Nick and I are buddies. We talk on Instagram. Uh, we mutually respect each other. I respect the hell out of him. He's awesome. But uh, yeah, so, okay, your opponent comes to the net. You're going to lob. What else? And by the way, we, it's important when people are talking that you have the same definitions of the words you're using. Um, uh, do you recommend swing vision? I think swing vision is amazing. That's how I do my strategy lessons. In fact, just as I was about to push live, um, I was uh, uh, looking at an email. I have a lesson this week with a gentleman uh, here in the States, and he sent me a swing vision video of him playing a match, and I'm going to strategize with him how to beat his opponents. Go cross court if there's more space, lob, um, hit the ball at their feet, hit the ball to opponent's feet, aim low. Uh, let's keep going. We got lob at the feet. Yeah. So here's what you want to think of. When your opponent comes to the net, and, and we can keep with the strategy here, and, and then I'd like to answer some of your um, technical questions. When your opponent comes to the net, involve them in the point. It's funny because there were, th the reason I thought of this was because we were just talking about the opponent uh, I'm sorry, serving and volleying. And we were saying that it's important to have a good volley when you serve and volley. But actually, what you'd be surprised with is that when you, when you go to the net, your opponent will try to avoid you. Your opponent will try to avoid you. Oh, we got 65 people here and only 34 likes. Oh, let's try to get it up there. Get, get that like total up there if you're on here. Thank you so much. So when you go to the net, your opponent is going to try to avoid you. And that's good because when you go to the net, when your opponent tries to avoid you, guess what they do? They miss. When they try to avoid you, they miss. And that's good for you. You don't have to have, thank you for the likes. I got a couple people hitting likes, hitting at their head, sure, <laughs> hitting on the body. When your opponent comes to the net, I want you to be smarter than your opponent. When you go to the net, they're going to avoid you. When, so when, they, when you go to the net, 
they're going to avoid you. They're going to hit lobs over your head long. The ball's going to go out. They're going to miss wide left and right. They're going to panic, but you're going to be smarter. You follow Two Minute Tennis on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok uh, and Threads and X. Um, and you listen to my podcast, Two Minute Tennis Podcast, everywhere podcasts are. Make sure you listen to those episodes. When, you're, when you go to the net, your opponent's going to, uh, going to um, avoid you, which means you don't have to have as good of a lob, right? You don't have to have, I'm sorry, not lob, I mean volley. You don't have to have such a great volley because your opponent isn't going to make you volley that much. You can win so many points by just going forward and your opponent freaks out and they avoid you. I want you to be smarter than that though. When your opponent comes to the net, I want you to hit it right to them. Now, if you can hit it low, that'd be great, but just make them volley. Half the time they'll screw up the volley. Remember, we just had people saying how they need to work on their volley or, oh, I don't really like volleys. So make your opponent volley. You're not playing Martina Navratilova or John McEnroe and hit it at their legs, of course. But, no, but so yes, that's the specific, but it's make them volley. Do not avoid them. Just make them volley. Half the time, they will screw that up. The other half, they'll hit it short. Now you come in and you have a passing shot to hit on the second shot. This is what is called, um, yeah, I might be playing Savage. This is, the, oh yeah, oh yeah, Sahil maybe. Um, this is what I call the two-shot passing shot strategy. The two-shot passing shot strategy. Hit your passing shot on the second shot. Don't go for the pass on your opponent's approach. Just make them volley. Half the time they screw it up. The other half, they don't just come in and volley away. Stop putting your opponents on a pedestal like you're playing Serena or Roger. That's not who you're playing. So stop treating them like that. If Roger Federer or Serena Williams is coming to the net on you, avoid them. That's your only chance. You're not gonna give them a ball at their feet and they go, oh, you know, they're not gonna struggle with that. But we don't play them, luckily. So force them to volley and then you can go for the pass on the second shot. Here's another one and I'd like everyone to answer this. What is the definition of a lob? I want somebody in the comment section right now. Oh, we almost caught up. We've got 60 people here and 47 likes. Do you think we can go over? Because some people have left, so the likes are still there. So let's see if we can get over. And I had um, uh, Bobby give, do the $5 donation. Thank you so much. I tried to, I was gonna follow him, but uh, lob over the head. So um, I want you to be more specific, Manu, because it sounds like you're trying to be uh, specific, but I want you to be even more specific. Lob over their head, meaning like just up in the air. It goes over their head, over the opponent, two times the net height. It's gotta be more than that. A lob, what's the definition of a lob? High and deep into the court. It's funny, I've been teaching tennis for uh, 26 years, over 26 years. And I only, I, I would say for the first 20 years, I didn't realize that people had the wrong definition of a, see, lands deep. Lob over the head. Yeah, see, this is this is an issue. This is a this is a coach's uh, uh, responsibility to make sure that students understand the actual definition of a lob. A lob is just a high ball. It has nothing to do with the opponent. Your definition of a lob should not include the opponent in the definition. A lob is just a high ball. That's it. Here's why I'm saying this. The reason players are bad at lobs, and if you look across the board with recreational tennis, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. The success rate of lobs is pretty bad. The reason is because when the opponent comes to the net and we go for a lob, we think avoid the opponent and make the ball bounce behind them, which is kind of where I was trying to lead Manu John. Uh, down that path. I was trying to get him to say that because it seemed like that's what he was trying to say. I don't want you to avoid your opponent. Remember, when your opponent comes to the net, I want you to involve them in the point. I want you to include them in the point. If you just got here, thank you so much. I just had four people walk in. Be sure to hit that like button. We've almost caught up. We almost got the likes up to, uh, up to the number of people here. When your opponent comes to the net, 
I want you to lob high, not just deep. If you can get depth in the court, great, but you don't need depth. You need height. Get that ball up in the air and let them screw up the overhead. Mind blown. You will win more points off of a lob when the opponent hits an overhead. This is fact. You will win more points with your lob when your opponent hits an overhead than it is if you lob over them to avoid them. Do you know why? Uh, why we go high, they go low. We go, we go high, they go low. Uh, I think that's a political statement. <laughs> um, that's so funny. So when, I know exactly who you're referencing, by the way. Uh, so when the ball goes really high and lands just past the service line, they will screw it up. Yes, if you can lob over their uh, non-dominant side, absolutely. Those are all subcategories of get the ball up. And because what would be the reason to hit over their non-dominant side? Because you're not avoiding them. If you were avoiding them, it wouldn't matter. The ball's going to bounce behind them. So if we're lobbing over their non-dominant side, we're expecting them to hit the ball. So make them volley and hit the ball up super high. In my experience, if you can have 2.5 seconds uh, time frame between your lob and their contact on the overhead, which, by the way, is so much longer than you think, you think two and a half seconds. Oh, I bet I lob five seconds. No, you don't. It is so difficult to get your opponent to have to wait 2.5 seconds to hit an overhead. And, and the difference between 2.1 and 2.5 might as well be an hour. The success rate of your opponent hitting an overhead off of a lob that off the racket 2.1 seconds occurs to 2.5, you don't need tons of topspin. You don't. You, you, Eric, do not put your opponent on a pedestal that you need to put all this spin on the ball. If I have an, uh, if I have a spider in my kitchen, I don't need to blow it up with dynamite. Too much collateral damage. Like, it's overkill. There's way too much. Um, now, no, no. Djokovic's overheads are not bad. Um, they're just not as good as Federer's. So what I want you to do when your opponent comes to the net is force, the, yes, height. Height is more important than depth, and height is more important than spin. It is the thing. It is the diamond of all of the gemstones of when your opponent is at the net. Hit that ball straight up in the air. I love your human Thanks, Yeshin. Thank you so much. So when your opponent comes to the net, make the, if you make them volley or hit an overhead, the chances of winning go up. If you avoid them, your chances of winning go down. Now, we remember that amazing pass. We remember that amazing lob that just clipped the line. But remember, we're trying to win 55% of the points. Um, uh, Ryan is coaching for recreation players. Do players do... Uh, um, well, uh, I, have you ever seen Sampras versus Agassi? So here's the interesting thing. The pros don't play the way we think they do. The pros make the opponent volley. They do. We just remember the amazing passing shots. But making them hit a volley, especially a low ball, it happens. We, we've seen Sampras hit a low volley. That means Agassi was aiming low to his feet, right? Otherwise, it would just be passing shot, passing shot, passing shot. And why would Sampras have 14 grand slams if he was just getting passed every time? It's not because Agassi was not going for passing shots. He was, he was trying to keep it low and take it early and get it low. That's why he took it early so that Sampras wouldn't get as close to the net on those shots. All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, he is so, oh, Nadal's volleys are awesome. He is so underrated. His forehand volley is amazing. His forehand volley is so good. All right, let's go here. Hi, Ryan, thank you for the lecture. Always, I usually play doubles, always struggle with high. I don't know, geez, man, there are a lot. Smash the like button. Thanks, Eric, thanks so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I always struggle with the high bounce ball after service line and baseline when I'm in the back. Should I ground stroke or hit back? Uh, should I ground smash or hit a moon ball back? Yeah, so there are a couple options. So we're talking about playing doubles. You're in the back 
and your opponent hits a high ball. All right, so let's say this is you. This is the partner, right? And you serve, and you get a high ball that lands here. One thing you can do, and I just taught this to a guy on court. I was giving like an actual on court lesson. I, I do about one a week. In fact, I haven't taught actually an on court lesson in about a month. Um, my body feels amazing because of it, because uh, I'm not busting my body on a tennis court. But uh, I taught him to serve and immediately move into no man's land because his, one of his opponents was doing exactly that. If you are playing a team who tends to hit this high lobbing ball, that the ball is landing in no man's land, uh, the moment you serve, move up into no man's land. That way when they lob, you can then move forward and then take the ball out of the air. Now, if you'd like, you can play it off the bounce, but when you play a ball off the bounce with an overhead, you gotta make sure you hit slice. So if you hit a bounce overhead, you've gotta hit slice. You gotta really cut it, don't crush it. Curve that ball. That's why you always see off the bounce on the pros, the pros don't hit winners on those overheads from behind the baseline. They curve it and then the point continues. Um, you can take it on the rise, but that's a pretty difficult shot to move in and take the ball on the rise. So I would rather you move back and lob it. If it's high enough, take an overhead that you curve off the bounce or just move forward and take it out of the air. Uh, how close should you stand fault when you're at the net? I get the bisection part, but not the depth. Yeah, so it depends on the volume. Ooh, what am I going, what am I doing? Are you talking about um, singles or doubles? It sounds like uh, singles, Mike, because you're talking about bisecting. But can you just confirm right now? Singles, yeah. So it all depends, and this will be the exact answer that you're looking for, Mike. It'll be very clear cut and something that you can apply the next time you go out onto the court. How close you are to the net depends on where your opponent is. Now there is a gray, but I'm gonna talk about the black and white because the gray, there's gray in everything. Let's talk about the black and white of it so that we really know in two different scenarios and you can look for those scenarios. You're at the net. Let's say your opponent is on the forehand side, right? So you know that you should be here. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is amazing. I so appreciate all. And if you have a, um, a YouTube channel, let me know. I want to follow it. Thank you for the donation. Thank you so, so much. So when your opponent is here, you want to stand here, slightly on the same side, because you want to bisect where they can hit the ball. But how close and how far you are depends on where they're standing. Uh, how much is that in real money? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Even if it's 10 cents, I appreciate it. Yeah. Any do the fact that somebody took the time to donate, it means the world to me. It doesn't matter how much it is. Um, so when, when you hit a really strong approach shot or a really strong volley and you're pushing your opponent back, Mike, they're more likely to lob. I mean, just think about it. You're getting pushed back. You're more, like, you're more likely, not always, not always. We don't care about the exceptions. We care about the rule. We want to live in the rules, not the exceptions of life. So if we push our opponent back, we stand farther back. If we hit a short volley and our opponent gets pulled inside the baseline, Mike, we get tighter to the net. Mike, I want you to think about uh, ice hockey, right? So think about a goalie. Where do they go to become bigger? They go forward. They get out of the goal. Like if I don't want you to see this board, I go toward the camera to cover up the board, right? I go toward my phone to cover up the board. So when your opponent is inside the baseline, they are not going to lob. And if they do lob, they're gonna completely screw that up, by the way. When your opponent is inside the baseline, get tight to the net because you are trying to get closer to that bisecting. If you volley and you push them back, then move away from the baseline because they're most likely gonna lob. Remember, we're trying to win 55% of the points. And even, 
even Djokovic and Alcaraz winning 71% of the points at Wimbledon at net in the final, if they're winning 71%, which is absolutely dominating, guess what? That means they lost 29%. <laughs> and that's okay. But you have to be willing to lose at the net 40%, 45%, 35%, 30%. You're going to lose at the net. We just want to win more than we lose. Like, obviously, because this is, this is where we have a huge advantage. So the way you know how close to get to the net has very much to do with your opponent's situation. If they're leaning in and they're going to crush it inside the baseline, you close off. You get closer and you react. If you push them back, and let's say you get a low volley, let's say you're coming to the net, they hit it to your feet, and you volley deep into the safety post right here, push them back, and they're like this, don't go like that. You're just, you're, you are rushing the net to lose at a faster rate at that point, because then you're moving away from where they're most likely going to hit. So you, you stay back. You got it? I hope that helps. Guys, really quickly here. I just want to tell you one thing. I just, um, we just spent, I got 61 people here. I just spent 46 minutes giving you my all to help you play better tennis. If you can, stick around for the next uh, 46 seconds. I do Zoom lessons. So a Zoom lesson, thank you, so Bobby. Thank you, you're amazing. Oh, come on, Bobby. Stop with this, stop with this. No more, Bobby, you're cut off. That's 10 bucks, you're cut off, no more. Um, so here, here's how it works, but thank you. That's so nice. <laughs> thank you. Hey, we, we surpassed. Thank you, Lart. Thank you. We surpassed, uh, 61 or 62 thumbs up with 60 people here. That's good. Thank you so much. So I do zoom private lessons. If any of you, <laughs> if any of you would like me to work personally with you, I'm running a sale that ends tonight. Go to my website, twominutetennis.net. Thank you, Yejin. It's only $50 to meet one-on-one -on -one live with me for an hour. You send me videos of your serve. I just taught a, a young, uh, uh, it was a 15-year-old girl and her mom. The two of them were on the call with me this morning. They were my lesson, I don't know, about six hours ago. I'd had a lesson with them. They're in Indiana. I'm in Philadelphia. Um, hey, thanks, Hater. Thank you so much. And... Uh, I worked with her on her forehand and her serve. And I put her side by side. I, I, I shared my screen on Zoom. She's demonstrating in her house and I'm demonstrating and I'm showing her. I put her side by side, I put her forehand side by side with Djokovic, uh, Radicanu. I put her serve side by side with um, JJ Wolf, Layla Fernandez, Maria Sakari. Um, who else? Uh, Taylor Fritz. And I showed her on Zoom, sharing my screen, all the things that she could do to improve. Like this girl was beaming. She's like, oh my gosh, she's been playing tennis for about a year, 15 months, and she's never learned all this stuff. The whole thing was recorded. Um, so if you would like me to work one-on-one -on -one with you where you send me videos of your footwork, of your matches, of your, your forehand, backhand serve, kick serve, whatever, slice backhand, your volleys, your overhead, go to twominutetennis.net and pick up a Zoom private lesson with me. It'll be the best tennis lesson you ever take. Um, so thank you. All right, let's see some of these questions. I've got a couple. Uh, John McDonough, what's up, John? Hi, Ryan. Why do people hit cross-court drops in it instead of right in front of them? The ball would be in the air less time. Uh, John, that's a great question. So the reason is because you can hit the ball. F I just knocked over my rackets. Um, it's because, John, you can hit the ball farther and the ball stays closer to the net. Let me explain. So if I'm here, John, let's say you hit the ball short and I run in, right? If you have a lot of momentum, from here to here is 27 feet. So if you have a lot of momentum, it can be pretty tough to hit the ball a short distance. It's possible, but it's not easy, right? None of us are pro tennis players, so we can't act like, oh, that's easy for me. No, it's not. Because if it were easy, we'd, we'd be in Toronto right now. But when we are here, we can hit the ball 27 feet and have the ball land 
three feet from the net. So it gets our opponent to have to run a really far distance, but it was easier for us because we got to actually hit the ball up to 27 feet in the air, and it was still really far from our opponents. In order for your, because when you hit a drop shot, when your opponent, oh, man down, when your opponent hits a drop shot on you, they usually step inside the court, which they should. So for you to hit the ball and have it be three feet from the net, and you're right here, that is an incredibly difficult shot. So, and sometimes it can be a shorter distance for that person anyway. So the reason the pros will often hit this shot is because they can use the fact that the ball can travel a farther distance, and so, which means it's easier for them that they, they have um, like margin for error and they don't have to be so perfect, but the ball is still a far distance from the opponent. So that is why. All right, I got time for one more question. I'm, I'm serious about this, guys. I want you to go to twominutetennis.net and sign up for a Zoom private lesson with me. It will be the best, best tennis lesson you've ever taken. Guaranteed. And they're normally a lot more than, yeah, you got it, John. Uh, J John, just make sure you hit the ear of the ball. Don't hit the nose. All right, let's see. Uh, last question, John Klein. I watched the slicer video with the Topson Pro. Ryan, when hitting the slice, I think point of contact is diagonal, not across the nose. Okay. So you're, you're partly right. <laughs> you're partly right. Remember, there is drag and there is friction. So here's, here's the idea. The ball goes where your strings point, not where your racket travels. That's about 90% right. There is incidence equals reflection, and there is drag on the ball. But let's take this, all right? I've got a, um, I've got a closet here. That's the fuse box closet. That's where the, that's where the, break, that's the breaker box closet right there. And then uh, here's the steps to go up to my kitchen, all right? The question is, can I swing toward the steps? Can I swing here? Can I make my racket move that direction and hit the ball to the closet? Can somebody answer that question for me? Yes or no? Can I swing that way and make the ball go that way? Uh, I thought it was a door to go out. <laughs> no, no, this is like, It's just like the breaker box closet. <laughs> like it's like one person can fit in it. I've had people, I've had people say, hey, is somebody gonna walk through that door? <laughs> I'm like, no, no. So of course I can hit the ball to the, to the um, closet, to the breaker box closet for the house while swinging toward the spindles because my strings will face that way. So watch, I'm gonna swing that way and the ball just hit the doors or the door, right? Now, when I did that, that puts spin on the ball. Spin is created when your strings face in one direction and your racket travels in a different direction, right? So I swung that way with my strings pointing that way and the ball went to the closet, right? So it's like a basketball player spinning a basketball on their finger. So when we think about hitting a slice serve, what we have to understand is we want the strings to face where we want the ball to go, basically. We want the strings to face where we want the ball to go. And we need to swing to the right of that as a righty and to the left of that as a lefty. So then what we have to understand is what is the definition of the nose? Because when we said... Uh, you can make a, I can make a, yeah, look up a banana forehand. Go on to, go on, well, you're on with me now, but when we get off here, look up two minute tennis banana forehand and you'll see me teach how he does that. And I do one uh, in a couple of them in the video. But the question was, uh, hold on a second. Um, uh, not across the nose. Okay, so what is the definition of the nose? The nose of the ball is 180 degrees from your target. That's the, de the definition of the nose of the ball isn't necessarily like just the court itself in relation to the court. Take the target. So if I, here's USPTA written on the ball, right? Which part of the ball, which part of the ball do I have to hit in order to get the ball to go to the closet? I have to hit the T. 
Because if I hit the P, the ball goes straight ahead. So I have to hit the T. So we're going to call that the nose. We're going to say the nose of the ball. Now, if you want to say, hey, the P is the nose and we're going to hit the cheek, that's fine, whatever. But the, the idea here is we want to get our strings to face where we want the ball to go. And if we swing that way, then we get no spin. But if we hit that same place and we go across, then we get the spin that we want. What we do not do is hit the ball like this. Because if we hit the ball like this, the ball's going to go wide of our target. That's why we have to turn enough sideways and swing enough across the ball that we're actually hitting the T and not over on like the ear of the ball, like way over here. Like some people, they think that you hit slice like this. Some people think you curve around the ball. There are some very prominent, well-known coaches who talk about going up to the ball and doing this. You know exactly who he is, by the way. Uh, that is not what happens, not even close. So you pronate on every serve, flat, slice, kick. Um, but that's the idea, is what you don't do is swing towards your target with your strings to the side. You swing to the right of your target as a righty with your strings facing your target, and that gives you the side spin on the ball. So if I do this, am I hitting a flat serve or a slice serve? You don't know. You don't know if I'm hitting a flat serve or a slice serve. If I'm swinging toward the closet, which is where my strings are pointing, I'm hitting a flat serve. If I'm swinging toward the stairs, I'm hitting a slice serve. Both balls initially go the same direction, approximately. There is some drag on the ball with the strings, but we're gonna take that out of the calculation because it's minimal in, in what produces where the ball goes and where the strings, uh, the action that is put on the ball. So that's, yes, you, you wanna think of swinging to the right with your strings facing your target, if you're right-handed. Thank you so much, everybody. Look at that, we got way, uh, you still, you will still have some spin on it. Yeah, and so John, even on the flat serve, I want you to think of your flat serves as not being flat. I, I like to ask people, John, I like, to be, I like to say, what spin is on a flat serve? And you watch people go, what? Oh yeah, ooh la la, there you go, yeah, and you know who I'm talking about. Um, buffet. Blah, 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 blah. Um, so, uh, I totally forgot what I was going to say. Hold on a second. Oh yeah. So the flat serve still has spin. So what you want to think of is you, you hit all serves with spin. It's just some with less, some with more. So, um, you can go on two minute tennis right after I'm going to get off the, the call here in about a minute. Um, if you want to watch me demonstrate the, uh, banana forehand, uh, can you coach ambidextrous? No. I mean, I can coach lefties, but yeah. What I do with Zoom lessons for coaching ambidextrous people is I just take videos of me and I flip them. That way I become left-handed. That way I can teach people and show them the actual look it should be. Um, in fact, that girl I was telling you, I taught a Zoom lesson this morning to a girl in Indiana. Her, um, uh, she was right-handed and there was something about Nadal's serve I wanted her to learn. So I just took a video of Federer and reversed it. And then I showed her Federer. I, I don't mean Federer. I meant to say Nadal. Um, I showed her a, a video of Nadal serving and I just reversed it uh, so that she could learn because she was a righty. So thank you all so much. If you would like me to personally work with you, today is the last day. It's going to go more than twice uh, that price uh, after midnight. But today is the last day to pick up my Zoom private lessons where you send me videos of your serve or your backhand, your forehand, your slice backhand, your volleys, or your net play or your uh, overheads or your matches or your footwork, anything you want to work on in an hour. I will meet with you live on Zoom. I see you. You see me. You're asking me questions. I'm putting you side by side with the pros. It is the best. I mean, I left teaching on court for 24 years. I left to just teach Zoom because it is so incredible. And the results that I'm getting with my students are, are 10 times what you would get with on-court lessons. Like on-court lessons, they really hold you back. On-court lessons, they, they're, they're slow. You have to take 10 lessons just to learn everything you need to learn when you could learn everything in one lesson. Um, you get a recording of the Zoom lesson, which you don't get with on-court lessons. Um, you don't see yourself side by side with the pros with an on-court lesson. Uh, so go to twominutetennis.net uh, to grab your Zoom lessons today at only $50 an hour. It's ridiculous. Um, so I got to go. Any questions, just throw them in the comments below and we'll check it out. On-court lesson is like a, a, a ball machine. Yeah. All right. Thank you all and have a great day. You got this.